Estelle Chapon, a seamstress with a keen eye, strolled along Boulevard Robert Schumann in Nantes, minding her own business. It was an ordinary Monday at 2 p.m. on the 4th of April, 2011, when she glanced toward house number 55 on her usual route. Something caught her attention. The mailbox bore an unusual label. Return all mail to sender. But that wasn't all. The window shutters, always wide open in the past, were tightly closed. Even when the occupants of house number 55 went on family vacations, those shutters stayed wide open. Why were they shut now? Tuesday, 5th of April, 2011 arrived, and as Estelle passed by, nothing changed. The shutters remained firmly closed, stubbornly hiding whatever lay beyond them. Wednesday rolled in, and off to work she went, noticing the eerie, unchanged state once more. Finally, unease gnawing at her, she dialed the police. Estelle knew the family of House 55. She'd sew alterations for the kids' clothes and meticulously iron shirts for the man who lived there. Every day, like clockwork, she spotted the woman of the house fetching the kids from school. Yet this story isn't about Estelle Chapon. It's about the mysterious family of House Number 55, the house dubbed the House of Terror. But who exactly lived behind the closed shutters of House 55? Xavier-Pierre-Marie Dupont de Ligonnès, the head of the family, was an enigmatic figure. Although Xavier was an aeronautical engineer with a coveted degree from Ensma, his professional endeavors were vague. Some neighbors believed he was a salesman, while many others thought he was a businessman. Whatever he was, he was successful. But a cloud of mystery always surrounded his work and daily activities. His wife, Agnès Hodanger, a devoted assistant at Blanche de Castile Catholic School in Nantes, dedicated herself not only to her job, but also to instill religious values in her children. Regularly attending Mass with her kids, she was known for her kindness, but upheld strict principles, especially regarding the religious education of her children. The children, Arthur, Thomas, Anne and Benoit, each carried their unique aspirations and personalities. Arthur, recognized by Xavier as his son when he married Agnes, pursued studies in IT while working as a waiter in Nantes. Arthur was 20 years old. Thomas, with a passion for music, pursued his studies at the Catholic University of the West in anger, maintaining a discreet presence among peers. Thomas was 18 years old. Anne, an academically inclined young girl, was in 11th grade, studying at a private school. Anne was 16 years old and shared her mother's devoutness and was well regarded for her considerate nature. Benoit, the youngest at 13 years old, served as an altar boy at St. Felix Church, reflecting the family's deep ties to their religious beliefs. He too attended a private school. However, despite their seemingly ordinary lives, a mysterious veil hung over House 55, shutters sealed, mail unanswered, and an eerie silence enveloping the once bustling family home. Questions loomed in the neighborhood's whispers. Where is the Dupont de Ligonnet family? On the 13th of April, the police arrived at House 55, when Estelle Chapon raised the alarm. No one answered the door, and the front door was locked. Despite their attempts to seek entry, the silence inside amplified the sense of mystery. Finally, a locksmith was called to gain access to the house. Inside, a surreal sense of normality prevailed, a hauntingly undisturbed interior, as though the family had quietly packed up for a vacation and departed. No traces of foul play tainted the house. However, Estelle couldn't shake off her doubts. Her keen observation uncovered a stark anomaly, the absence of all family vehicles except the husband's Citroen C5. How could a family of six fit into a medium-sized sedan with their belongings? But Estelle's concerns fell on deaf ears. The authorities remained unmoved and dismissed Estelle's unease as insignificant, failing to comprehend the gravity of the situation.
Xavier's lineage is traced back to an aristocratic heritage rooted in Annonay, nestled within the Vivarai region of southeastern France. Ancestral ties echoed through historical figures like Édouard Dupont de Ligonnet, whose family tree included Sophie de Lamartine, sister to the famed poet Alphonse de Lamartine. Within this prestigious lineage, Xavier's father held the distinguished title of a count, and the family's centre of heritage stood proudly in the form of a majestic castle nestled in the heart of France. It was in the vibrant era of the 80s that Xavier, then a young man of 20, crossed paths with Agnes, barely 16 or 17 years old. Their meeting sparked an instant passion. It was love at first sight. Xavier, charming and adventurous, stood in stark contrast to Agnes, a beautiful woman deeply rooted in tradition and conservatism. Driven by an insatiable longing for adventure and a desire to explore the world, Xavier made a difficult decision to break up and part ways with Agnes and set off on a journey that spanned continents. A year later, upon his return, fate revealed an unexpected twist. Agnes, now pregnant with another man's child, stood before Xavier. In a surprising turn of events, Xavier defied the norms of his noble lineage. Against expectations, he chose to marry Agnes, embracing the child as his own and raising the baby with love and devotion, a courageous act that challenged the strict customs of Versailles' elite. The union heralded the foundation of a family, one that bloomed against the backdrop of societal judgment, embodying resilience, love, and an unwavering commitment to each other. Within a week of their disappearance, between the 9th and 14th of April 2011, a wave of letters from Xavier descended upon the close relatives and family members of Xavier and Agnes, stirring a whirlwind of perplexity. These typed and unsigned letters bore a shocking revelation. Xavier, in his message, disclosed his covert involvement with the American Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, stating that the entire family had been compelled to relocate to the United States as part of a federal witness protection program. The letter further instructed the recipients not to attempt any form of contact for a considerable time, emphasizing the imperative need for secrecy. Xavier went on to advise spreading misinformation across social media, asserting that the family had purportedly relocated to Australia, a ruse designed to divert attention and conceal their actual whereabouts. Agnes's family was in disbelief. The notion that Agnes, a woman deeply rooted in traditional values, would undertake such a drastic step without any communication seemed ludicrous to them. They swiftly engaged with the district attorney's office, urging a thorough investigation into Xavier's incredulous claims. Authorities took action, and on the 15th of April, during the second search of the house, the investigators noticed photographs were notably missing from their frames, as though plucked from their frames, suggesting the family had taken these cherished memories with them. Yet nothing of significance was found, leaving the police grasping at elusive clues. A third search on the 18th of April failed to yield substantial leads, maintaining the shroud of mystery cloaking the Dupont de Ligonnès family's disappearance. The fourth and even the fifth visits to the house echoed the same sentiment. No definitive evidence emerged, leaving the authorities frustrated. However, the sixth visit on the 21st of April took a grim turn. A police lieutenant, scanning the surroundings, stumbled upon an unsettling anomaly beneath the overhanging terrace. Two dog bowls, seemingly innocuous at first glance, rested upon a wooden plyboard, concealing freshly disturbed soil below. Instinctively, the officers commenced an excavation. Three feet beneath the earth's surface lay a heavy-duty plastic trash bag, carefully sealed with tape. As they unraveled the layers, a chilling discovery emerged. A layer of thick blankets concealed something sinister. Cutting through these blankets revealed 
a human body lifeless and entombed within the confines of the makeshift grave. Shock and horror rippled through the investigators, shattering any hopes of finding the missing family unharmed. In the wake of the grim discovery lay a haunting scene that baffled investigators. Each body meticulously buried alongside a small religious icon, a candle, a cross or rosemary beads, hinted at a religious burial, as though the perpetrator held an eerie affection for the victims. The burial was steeped in religious symbolism. Within the graves rested the bodies of the mother and her three children, along with their two black dogs, a disturbing montage that hinted at a carefully orchestrated scene. In a separate grave lay the body of the eldest son, completing the tragic ensemble. Yet among the findings, a chilling absence lingered, the obvious absence of Xavier's body. The thorough search of the premises bore no trace of Xavier, positioning him as the prime suspect in this case. As the investigation progressed, Xavier, the missing father, became the prime suspect. Xavier's sister and his legal counsel passionately contested the accusations against him, highlighting a compelling argument Xavier had long suffered from chronic back pain. Given the confined space beneath the terrace, they argued it would have been physically implausible for Xavier to excavate such deep graves and bury multiple bodies. However, the chilling details of the murders added further layers of mystery and disbelief to the case. Each victim, after being sedated with sleeping pills, was tragically shot twice in the head, a methodical and cold-blooded execution. Yet, the absence of blood in the house confused investigators. Despite the brutality of the crime, there was a baffling absence of bloodstains, not a single trace anywhere in the residence. The lack of any blood splatter within the house raised a question. How could five individuals be shot in the head without leaving a single drop of blood behind? The notion of Xavier, an esteemed French aristocrat and truly loving father, committing such heinous acts was unfathomable to many. It challenged the very core of his noble lineage, making it inconceivable for him to orchestrate the death of his sons, his heirs. The police pieced together an account of Xavier's life, painting a different picture from the facade he projected. Despite exuding an aura of success, Xavier's businesses were now a mere facade, covered in financial struggles. His businesses, though presented as thriving, failed to yield genuine success. Xavier attempted to settle in Florida in 2001, which drained most of his savings, but the aftermath of the 9-11 tragedy hindered his aspirations, plunging him into a downward spiral. From 2001 until the fateful year of 2011, Xavier grappled with a relentless decline. His once thriving enterprises dwindled into financial abysses, leaving him trapped in a cycle of failed ventures. Xavier, a man of pride and dignity, found it hard to accept the humiliation of failure. The year 2011 took an even sadder turn with the passing of his father in January, leaving behind almost no inheritance, only a family signet ring and a 22 caliber long rifle. The scarcity of resources added to Xavier's misery. The combination of financial ruin, a shattered sense of pride, and the weight of familial loss cast a dark cloud over Xavier's world. Police investigation into Xavier's life unraveled a series of damning revelations that cast an ominous shadow upon his actions and movements in the days leading up to the family's disappearance, the termination of the house lease, closure of all bank accounts, and the unpaid school fees were indicated to the authorities as a systematic preparation. It was all pre-planned. Xavier's orchestrated communication on Agnes's behalf to her employer, pretending she was moving aboard. He sent her resignation to her employer, all of which appeared calculated and deceptive, not to mention all that happened after her death. Xavier made incriminating purchases, such as cement, a shovel, a hoe, 
rifle bullets, and lime, combined with visits to a shooting range, suggesting deliberate preparations for a heinous act. A suspicious receipt from a DIY store, dated late March and found far from Nantes, listed purchases including bin liners and adhesive plastic paving slabs, all of which were used on the gravesite. On April 2nd, Xavier acquired four 10 kilograms bags of lime, further raising eyebrows about his intentions. Maybe that's the reason police found no blood splatter. Witness accounts revealed Xavier loading large bags into his car and the unexplained absence of two of the children from school on April 4th due to purported illness. The following days unfolded with alarming events. Nobody answered the door to a bailiff and notices of withdrawal from the children's school, all portraying a meticulous plan to mislead and disassociate from their former lives. Investigators pieced together a grim timeline, postulating that Xavier allegedly executed his wife and three children on the night of April 3rd to 4th, followed by the murder of his son Thomas on April 5th. Xavier's calculated actions and orchestrated communications painted a harrowing picture of premeditated deceit and grim intentions, outlining a meticulously planned disappearance and a carefully crafted facade to cover up the disturbing truth. Xavier orchestrated the brutal murders of Agnes and the other three children, sparing Thomas initially while he was away at university. It was Thomas, as the eldest biological son and heir to the family name, who remained exempt from the initial onslaught, a decision that echoed a haunting hesitation on Xavier's part. But then, Xavier decided otherwise, manipulating Thomas's emotions, Xavier fabricated a distressing scenario, calling him back under the pretext of Agnes being involved in a bicycle accident, lying comatose. Xavier's hesitation to immediately execute Thomas, the heir to the family legacy, hinted at a complex and chilling rationale behind his actions. The sparing of Thomas amid the gruesome demise of the rest of the family left a haunting echo of a sinister plan, a plan to preserve the family's lineage through the survival of its heir. Yet this perceived humanity was short-lived, as Xavier's intentions soon led to the tragic fate of Thomas, plunging the entire family into a vortex of inexplicable horror and despair. Xavier embarked on a harrowing journey after the murders. Xavier's final journey commenced on April 11th, spending nights at various hotels across southern and southeastern France. His stays, paid for with credit cards, underscored a methodical attempt to not conceal his whereabouts and identity. He wanted to be found. Traversing through Blagnac, Le Ponte, and La Seine-sur-Mer, Xavier's journey, which included revisiting his former home, added a cryptic layer to his escape. As he ventured further, withdrawing cash in roquebrune sur argent on April 14th, Xavier's movements were captured by the ATM's surveillance cameras, marking the last known sighting of him at the Formula One hotel. It was there he abandoned the metallic blue Citroën C5 at the same hotel parking lot on April 15th, leaving authorities scrambling to trace his path. The discovery of his deserted vehicle and police searches culminated in an international arrest warrant issued on May 10th. In the last CCTV footage captured outside Formula One Hotel, Xavier was seen walking towards the mountains, carrying a bag and a concealed, elongated object, presumably the same rifle used in the tragic events. Authorities searched the natural caves around roquebrune sur argent They even engaged caving experts in an exhaustive search spanning weeks, but the elusive trail of Xavier remained cold. Nobody was discovered within the cave systems, intensifying the enigma surrounding his fate. Where is Xavier? Police, leaning towards the theory of Xavier's suicide, grappled with the possibility that he might have masterfully deceived them and vanished into thin air. Did Xavier commit suicide? Or has he escaped? People close to him believe he escaped to South America as he was fluent in Spanish and English. Do let us know what you think happened. Where do you think Xavier is now? Comment down below.